Hi, and uh, welcome to this interactive broadcast. My name's Bill Bankstones, Artistic Director of Tete Tete and Programmer of this festival, sitting in the Cockpit Theatre, where a couple of nights ago a marvellous young company performed folk tales. I'm here to introduce the film and say a couple of things before you see it, um, which are both very related, that, like everybody, we have had one hell of a year, and... The artists in the festival have come together like never before, really. We've been um, working all year trying to get this festival off the ground. I'm very proud and thrilled for everybody that we've managed to do so many performances with live audiences. It hasn't been easy, and we've been meeting week after week, again and again, rethinking everything. Every single show in the festival is different to what it set out to be, um, none more so than this, which was going to be a performance by some rotting fruit and has morphed into something completely different, which I'm sure will give you huge pleasure. So we've had a really painful but very creative year and uh, it's a tribute to the artists that they've got here. And do think of that when you watch this, how, what a journey this piece has been on. The second thing to say is that um, we work with the DCMS to reopen theatre with a pilot performance for opera and are now working with the Paul Hamlin Foundation to try and help the whole sector open. We need a chunky report at the end of this and we'd really appreciate your input. So you will be contacted after this and it will be a questionnaire that is more important than... Um, customer surveying it is in order to help theatre get going anyway time for theatre to get going so let's sit back and enjoy folk tales
Hi, um, welcome back everyone and huge apologies for the technical glitch in the middle of that. Um, I'm in a room full of uh, people here with four of us actually and a huge amount of technology um, and I'm afraid it just went and let us down. You're all really welcome to watch this again in the next 28 days. It's all up there for you. You access it just by coming into the, your account in the cockpit website and you can see the whole thing um, uh, in its perfect state. We still haven't quite worked out what happened and um, once again huge apologies for that. Um, now just to leave a little moment so this can be edited out and we can seamlessly move into a chat about what we've just seen. So I'll invite uh, the panel to join us. Great. Hello, everybody. And um, what a great performance. It was a, it was an amazing game. It was so lovely to play in front of a live audience. Um, Helena, perhaps you could tell us what it felt like. Oh, yeah, no, it was so lovely. It was a bit daunting at first because um, because it was so socially distanced. And obviously it's a, it's an intimate space anyway. Um, and yeah, when you can just sort of see pockets of people sitting around, it was it was a little bit daunting, but it was just so lovely to be back in a theatre. Um, yeah, yeah, it was really yeah. It's a it's be, it's a weird experience for us, I think. Yeah. Um, and it's it's odd for us because you you were about number five, so we're getting used to it. And then, of course, you guys all arrive and you're in this weird world, and so is the audience. But it was a great, great, great performance. Um, it would be really interesting to hear a little bit um, from Charlotte, I think, about how Fruit Bowl morphed into folk tales. Well, yeah, Fruit Bowl was an entirely different production and it was one we really wanted to do, but it would just be impossible to do it socially distanced. It's um, something we're hoping to do again in the future. Um, so we thought, what did we have in our repertoire that could evolve, could merge and could respond to the restrictions that were in place and that to a certain extent reflected some of the underlying trepidation and discourse going on in society at the minute. And that's when we thought, well, folk tales, folk tales would be perfect for that with only two performers. And it, it sort of sprung out of that and we, it, it really helped us think about staging and directing it as well. And I think it, it became a performance that really could only happen in response to what's going on in the world at the minute. Well, that's really interesting. That might be a really good moment just to say um, that we all need support and you artists need support. And um, there's a, a very low ticket price, price for this session because we would like you to show what you felt about it in enormous donations that go direct to the artists. Um, there's a link you can click on that has probably appeared in the chat, which says easydonate.org slash folk. And you ought to be able to find that on most of the web pages that led you to where you are now. Charlotte, perhaps you could tell us what these donations will end up spent on. Yeah, well, we were we were lucky enough to get Arts Council funding for this performance in particular. So any donations that we get through this, we're going to put together towards future performances. We have a few things on the horizon and we're hoping to work with a lot of the same artists who you've seen performing tonight. Um, and who you've seen as part of the creative team again tonight. We've had such a wonderful time working with Caroline, Lily, Sophie, um, Helena, we're hoping, and Chloe as well. We're hoping we can get everybody together to make bigger, better, more fabulous performances as restrictions lift further. And yeah, tell more stories, more folk tales. Yes, that's great. So if you want more, then um, support it. Now, uh, I should say that was Charlotte Marlowe, composer. It would be really nice to hear a little bit 
from Olive Brett's Caroline Hardacre about where this story came from, what inspired the words of this piece? Yeah, hi. <laughs> um, hi. Yeah, hello again. Um, yeah, people might have heard me trying to answer a chat question earlier <laughs> in the middle of the technical failure, but I think um, where the story came from, it's based on uh, five women in mythology. And it started with me and Charlotte just having some ideas backwards and forwards and thinking about how women quite are often mis mis misrepresented in their own mythological tale or um, their story is misrepresented in modern society. A lot of these women are either shunned from society or they feel lonely or isolated. That kind of was our link to kind of the, the situation that's going on at the moment. So we scoured the whole world looking for different cultures, different uh, backgrounds for these women and we picked a range that reflected everything from Hindu mythology to um, Scottish Gaelic people as well. So that's kind of where the characters came from and then it was really Charlotte that seamlessly pinched them together into one story and split, split one of them up so that it tied them all together as well and it just worked perfectly as a whole piece. So that's kind of the story behind that. Yeah, and um, tell us a little bit about what happened during during the piece. Lots of different things happened. <laughs> so I would say um, we've gone from someone like Medusa, where we gave a kind of more modern angle of Medusa's tale, which often people just see her as the, the snaky hair kind of figure. But what actually happened to her was that she was attacked and raped and then she was punished for it. So mm -hmm. like a lot of the other characters, this is from her viewpoint and her trying to seize control of that situation and tell it from her own angle. So that was Medusa. Another one, which is an example, is Ahalia, who's a figure from uh, Hindu mythology. And she's a kind of, a, she's man-made essentially by the gods and um, her life in circles around the men that she marries and is created by. But often enough, you don't ever hear her side of the story and how she actually had a self, a journey of self-discovery through the whole process, the painful process of what happened to her. And similarly with all of the women, they've all had a journey of self-discovery and whether it's through trauma or whether it's through happier times. So I guess, I guess that's the connection. Um, yeah, I hope that explains it a little bit. Yeah, there's so much in it. Um, there is. Maybe we... Ooh, somebody's got some very odd noise. Um, maybe we could move over to Lily, um, who directed the piece, and tell us a bit about what this was like bringing us to life on the stage for us. Yeah, it was a really interesting process for me because uh, I think there's always a certain amount of sensitivity needed uh, as a director when you come into a project at a later stage. Uh, so I obviously came into this actually like maybe a week ago for rehearsals when obviously so much of the R&D had already been done. Um, so it's quite interesting uh, looking at the practical constraints of the social distancing, uh, which actually is worth mentioning was actually a really helpful artistic collaborator I thought. I think the fact that we had a really clear channel on stage where we were allowed to move uh, actually ended up really grounding the piece. Um, obviously you having these five stories uh, and this poetry meant that a lot of the contextual narratives had sort of been abstracted in the sort of process of translation of composition and poetry so a lot of sort of my work was trying to work out how we could navigate that as an audience uh, and how we could sort of curate a physical structure to sort of uh, sense the fact that we were navigating our way through uh, not only different different stories but actually quite complex stories uh, that sort of rely on quite a strong foundational contextual knowledge. Uh, so a lot of that was using movement uh, and working out how we could perhaps use the props that we had uh, and also using our wonderful violinist Sophie as well. So actually it was a lot of sort of practical constraints that actually combined uh, to hopefully offer some really like creative solutions. Um, so yeah, so it was quite a complex little piece actually. Um, and I had never really done anything like that, like staging a song cycle in a way. 
Um, mm. But it was a real collaborative uh, effort, you know, right down to the amazing technical team uh, at Tete a And of course, you know, the Paul Hamlin Foundation that have supported us, you know, financially with this. Uh, and I think, yeah, the whole process has been a real collective uh, endeavor, which is just fantastic after such turbulence over the last few months. So. Yeah, it's it's really great to hear um, people being really responsive. That it is it, it's great for our audience, I think, to understand how much change we've been through to bring these live shows to live audiences. I think you guys, like right across the festival, have been so inventive and clever at taking this COVID situation and turning it to your advantages and all of us making virtue of necessity. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit from Chloe. Chloe Rodham did these beautiful animated projections, which rather tantalising for you probably, you don't see quite so well in the video, but we'll do a little bit of audio description that there was this landscape all the way through the piece that morphed with what looked like washes of ink into from season to season, or um, you could see actually a whole load of, I think there were sunflowers sprouting at one point. They were all absolutely beautiful. Um, at what point did you come into the project and what inspired those? So I came into the project at the start of um, putting this together for this festival. Um, and I'd started off delving into the, the lyrics of um, that Caroline had written and we had a chat together um, with all of us to think about um, from each of um, the team's point of view as to um, what those stories meant to each other and also the, the visuals behind that um, and um, especially from Caroline coming up with some of the um, visual symbolism of the imagery so it was created as a kind of mixture between um silhouettes almost like a paper cutout and also mixing in those watercolor textures as well um, and um, that all came together composited digitally into what you could see on the um screen there behind the performance it was really interesting to see that tonight of how that worked with the staging of it as well it was fantastic to to watch that through it was brilliant well it's fantastic to hear about it some of you may have noticed that uh, bill has unfortunately popped out had to pop downstairs for one of our live shows here at the cockpit but he has been replaced by me i'm leo i'm the marketing director at tete -tet. i'm also a libretto director and been having a lot of fun seeing this show in fact for the first time because of uh needing to make space in the show because of all of these social distancing requirements. So just to remind everyone in the chat, you are, in fact, if you would like to ask the, these wonderful people any questions, do feel free to pop a question in there. Because we had that slight technical delay, we're planning on perhaps having five minutes of extra space and time to make sure you get essentially a chance to talk rather than it just necessarily being me and Bill filling in. So I'm just checking the chat to see if anyone has asked anything, but so far, no, in which case I get to ask my question. Uh, obviously, all of these myths come from very different cultures and whether the reference points of how you structure a story or the music, they're all wildly different. So how did each of you, perhaps starting with, uh, with Caroline, in fact, in the libretto, and then moving through the various stages of process from com composition to production to directing and animation, how did each of you... Uh, work with those very different cultures you were drawing from? Um, well, I, I started to see the, the different pieces as very separate pieces. So each one, I wanted it to be quite unique and original. So and each one had its own vibe, I guess. So one of them heavily based in India, lots of <laughs> colors and smells and tastes and images of food and feasting. Um, whereas at the other end of the scale, we've got one in the Scottish Highlands, which is you know, rain, drizzle, mountains, it's cold, it's windy. So I've tried to explore it in terms of seeing 
difference between each one and then I guess the magic would come in when they were stitched together in the ordering and splitting certain pieces to weave together between the pieces mm -hmm. but for me I tried to make them as unique as possible so that we could have sort of a diverse range of sounds and emotions coming through the libretto that's kind of my angle Lovely. and then Charlotte how did you pick up on that why I thought it was just a joy to work with pieces that were so different because it really gave me a great jumping off point for finding very distinct characters for to lie within this opera. And then it, it, there was the interesting challenge, as Caroline said, of uh, stringing them together. And we started to think about, um, in R&D, we started to think about ways that these poems all link together. And you do find threads that go throughout all of mythology and all of folklore across the world. I think it's, it's one of the wonderful things about folklore is that it deals with very human, very um, universal emotions and thread to tie them all together. So the one that we actually split that you might have noticed was Morrigan. That's where the that's where the red comes back all the time in the colour washes. It's where you'll see Helena go into the crow's stance. Um, and the reason we split Morrigan was because Morrigan is known in mythology as the triple goddess. So she has these three aspects to her. Um, you sometimes see it in Maiden, Mother and Crone. And the, the wonderful thing about the way Caroline had written that poem is that you can pick out three sections from it. You can pick out anger in the first section where she's the crow above war. You can pick out the middle section where she notices the man who she's in love with. And then you can pick out the last section where she realizes betrayal and once again transforms back into that crow, into the, the spirit of war. Um, yeah, so to, to condense that, I, I think the, the distinction between the pieces was incredibly stimulating. Um, just from the point of view of the challenge, really, trying to find a cohesive narrative to weave them all together. And what was that like then to perform for you, Helene? Oh, so much fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the characters that um, Caroline and Charlotte created were just incredible. And they just, I find that they bring so much out of me as a performer and as an artist. I find Charlotte's music is often, this is what I love so much about her music, is quite free and it really allows the performer to like add their stance on it. Um, so yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. It was quite, yeah, in a way it's quite, it's difficult to um, to link them. But what I found that helped me was just like the strength of each character and that's kind of the way that you can link them and like the emotion behind each character as well. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. I, no, I suppose then, now we haven't heard anything from Sophie actually, have we? Sophie, are you still here? Yep. Hello. Lovely. Um, because you were m much more active than, you know, just a usual opera where you were sitting in the pit. So I wondered how you'd found this process of working maybe more as a character than, uh, you know, a standard, say, orchestral opera position? Um, yeah, it was a completely new experience for me. Um, I've done some opera work before, but as you said, it, it would be sitting in the pit, and I it, I felt so much more connected to the whole um, meaning behind it, and um, each character, um, each kind of portrait, um, understanding just hearing Lily's directions and 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 getting close to the text um it was yeah it was really um great to have that insight that I wouldn't usually have well thank you all very much hold on let me just check how much time we have left uh so in that case since we're coming towards the end of this I thought why don't we just go around each of you and if there's anything else you'd like to add whether that's uh future projects you've got coming up as a company or things about football you really want us to know for when it eventually gets to emerge into a less socially distant world. Uh, shall we uh, start off with Lily? 
I think uh, my only thing is obviously everyone has different projects going on, but I think the most important thing is for just continued collective support from everyone, you know, from everyone watching the viewing, you know, go and see as much social distance theatre as you can. And, you know, remember that it's not just, you know, the performers and, you know, us here on the panel that you see who have had a really rough ride in, you know, COVID. It's the technicians, the people who works in the box office, you know, the amazing filming crew. And I think that, you know, the best way forward is just to go and see and watch and absorb uh, as much as you possibly can. And I'm incredibly grateful to have got to work on this project with such an amazing team. So, yeah, that's all from me. <laughs> That's a great thing to say. And Sophie? Similarly, similar to Lily, I mean, I haven't performed anything to an actual audience in a venue since March. And it, 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 I, I can't wait to go and see something. I haven't seen anything in a venue either. Um, and it's really kind of sparked a urge to do that. And I think it's really important for everyone to keep kind of that love and that sharing the performing and watching um, and kind of engaging both in both ways, both sides of it. Um, and it was a great opportunity to do that, a great venue. Oh, that's that's a very kind of you to say. So what about you, Chloe? Anything else you'd like to throw in here? Um, I would, I'd like to thank all of the team for getting me to be part of the project because it was absolutely fantastic to be part of it and a real insight into um, the performance of the opera as well. Um, and it's been a real lifeline working on this project. It's such a fantastic creative project in such a, a difficult um, time and circumstances. So just thank you to the team, really. Lovely. And then that leaves us with Caroline and two more people. Not really leave, we're halfway. <laughs> um, actually, mine's really similar to, to Chloe's because um, this is, I haven't been long in writing for opera and music. Um, usually what I do is a bit more writing for books, poetry, stories, that kind of thing. And things like this, and the more people support the arts, the more opportunities there are for things like this, I mean that we can do a lot more collaboration, crossing audiences, letting new people experience brand new things that they might never have ever accessed before. So I just want to thank everybody for getting me involved in the first place, particularly Charlotte at the very beginning. Um, and yeah, keep supporting things, whether it's online or in person, because it, it really does make a difference. And that's it. <laughs> It's an important thing to say. And then let's, let's in fact, come on to Charlotte. Um, yeah. I, I, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Fabulous. I, I was going to echo what everybody else has said. I mean, it feels weird to say, but it, 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 it has such a great experience collaborating with everybody. I couldn't have asked for a better team of people to work with. Um, and if you want to keep seeing more for us, please follow us uh, at Medusa Collective without an E on all our social media channels. Um, donate if you're able. If you're not to, just keep an eye out and retweet us. And there's so many ways you can support people in the arts. It's not all about money. It's just about word of mouth. It's about getting out there. It's about making sure that we're seen as valid parts of society, as, as important things and art's becoming so important now while people are stuck in the house while people are stuck in lockdown and yeah lovely and helene anything else you'd like to add as the final thing before the wrap out from tete tete begins um yeah definitely i just want to say it's been so much fun working with tete tete um so i'm not sure if everyone watching knows but we've been having weekly zooms basically like throughout lockdown with all the artists and all the creatives and it's just been it's basically you know it's been so supportive which has been so nice and like seeing the creativity and like thinking outside the box and other artists helping other artists it's been so lovely um so that's been a really great experience and yeah to echo what charlotte said about um following us as a collective we're going to be doing lots more exciting things in the future um i also want to say that um we had some amazing artwork done for this production by an Australian artist called May Ticks, 
and we are actually selling um, the prints. So if you want a print, you can head over to our website, Medusa Collective, and you can buy a print there. Um, but yeah, apart from that, it's just been so much fun. So thank you to everyone. And thanks for watching. Well, thank you all for being so much fun to work with and persist through lockdown with. It's, uh, you know, the journey from first talking to you about, what was it, a kiwi and a lime sitting in a fruit bowl in a cocktail bar to mm -hmm. now a harrowing exploration of international myths about femininity and non-binary people uh, has been quite a journey. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, you should be able to find a donation link in the chat to easydonate.org forward slash folk. Uh, and that is a great way to support these young artists. Tet Tet, the Opera Festival 2020 is running for the next two weeks and then with online content available for 28 days after that. And if you would like to listen to these wonderful young artists and support the future of opera, one of the best things you can do is come to more of these online shows. You can even come to live shows in the cockpit if you're in the London area. Literally right now beneath my feet, I can hear the start of Paradise Lost. So that one will be on broadcast in two days time. And when we send you the feedback form, it's not just us asking you for normal customer level feedback. It's so much more about how do you want to access art in the future? What can we do to help to continue helping young artists and developing artists in much like these wonderful people you've been watching tonight and that we're working with the Paul Hamlin Foundation. We've previously been working with the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Support and Sport. We did the first opera performance since lockdown began as part of those pilot projects. So please do donate if you can. If you can't, then one of the best things to do is to share on social media. So that's at Medusa Collective without an E on the end. And if you want to tag Tet Tet, that's at Tet Tet Opla on pretty much all social media platforms except TikTok, because we don't yet have a TikTok, but we will <laughs> soon. Uh, so thank you all for listening or watching, as the case may be. And do come to more things. And until then, have a lovely evening. Bye.